Okay, we are doing the time conundrum. This is a puzzle from the 2013 MIT Mystery Hunt by David Farhi. Yeah, I'm just going to jump right in. Let's go. Spoiler warning. Uh, I think back in 2013, not as many people were viewing puzzles on their phones. Formatting doesn't work as well on narrower screens. During the hunt, HQ called to say red herring was incorrect for time conundrum, and then time conundrum unlocked. But yeah, let's just keep this in mind. So this is something that actually happened during the hunt. HQ would tell you the red herring was incorrect for this, as if you had guessed red herring, and then the puzzle unlocked. And it's quite long, so I'm going to read through once uh, the whole thing. Sometimes it's very tempting to, to jump right in and start solving as soon as you get some idea of what's going on, but I'm going to try to read the whole thing, just so I know what to expect more. You're about to embark upon a conundrum. Unlike other puzzles, the instructions for this puzzle are clear and explicit. Simply follow the instructions exactly as they are written, and the answer will be spelled out for you. If instruction 5 says to cross off instruction 4, then you will still do instruction 4 when time step 4 comes along. Some time travel is involved here, but it seems like it's possible to get to instruction 4 after getting to instruction 5 and crossing it off. But you still do instruction 4 when time step 4 comes along. Now, yeah, definitely don't understand how this works yet. Unlike other conundrums, this is a time conundrum. You may encounter time travel, closed timelike curves, and if you do things wrong, inconsistencies and grandfather paradoxes. Your goal is to make it through with a single consistent history. During each time step, two things happen in this order. One, you take the action listed in your instructions. Two, any items present act. After the time step is complete, but before the next time step, any items arriving from distant points in time appear in the center of the room. Uh, section two here talks about how items behave. Number six, if there are several copies of the same item present and the instructions do not specify a particular one, they mean the oldest one. And uh, number five here says the oldest one is the one that has been in the room for longer. And then there are two specific items that they call out here, a duck uh, and a robot, and they act on their own turn and they both manipulate the time machine in a certain way. Here it says you will often be told to use letters and numbers interchangeably, so A equals one, B equals two. Okay. And if you ever find yourself with several sets of instructions in the room, use the oldest one. So I guess the instructions that we're reading that we're going to be making changes on is an item itself, and that could be sent through time. <sighs> Great. The instructions item has a space marked answer at the top of the section. Some instructions will tell us to put uh, letters or numbers into the answer space, and then when we're done, uh, the answer will spell out the uh, answer to the puzzle. All right, so the time machine has a dial, which can be set to any number. When you or something presses the big red button, then anything inside the time machine gets sent to the center of the room at a point in time determined by the dial. If you press the big red button on time step 17 and the dial says plus 3, the items appear on time step 20. Okay, so warm-up A has steps numbered 0 through 5. Um, it's got a time machine and a duck. It doesn't say anything about instructions or writing an answer here. Yeah, so I guess you don't get an answer out of this. Warm up B has instructions zero through three and just the time machine. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back and look at these. Ah, here we go. 10 blanks for the answer and then instructions. Okay, we're about halfway through the web page and we're just getting to the instructions. Okay, great. So in step one, it says that a new set of instructions just appeared with the answer written on it. Go ahead and call it in. So step two already has a lot of complicated stuff going on. It says that the instructions that just appeared are older, um, so you should use those. So right uh, starting in step two, we're not even using any of these instructions. We're using the instructions as they have been mod modified before being sent back in time. So the instructions we're using, which is the ones that came through time, already have ans the answer written at the top. So it says, Whenever you're told to write a letter, don't write it on the copy of the instructions you're using. Instead, write it on your original one, which is blank. And it says, now write the appropriate seventh letter in the slot, not the correct letter. That would lead to a paradox. Write the unique letter, which does not lead to a paradox. So we don't copy the seventh letter from one instruction to the other. We, co we put down some other letter that, based on all the instructions, we know will eventually be turned into the right letter, I think. So then we get some more normal things. Uh, read the time machine's dial and write it into the slot where the final answer has an S. Okay, we don't know what the time machine's dial says at this point, and we don't know what uh, which slot has an S. Uh, presumably we'll figure those out going forward. Step 11, go buy a cucumber and put it in the time machine. Step 12, add the square of the ninth letter of the final answer to the time dial. Step 13, press the big red button. So in step 14 is the first time we actually amend the instructions. 
Um, it says to make a change to step 22 and step 29. Oh no, step 22 of the younger instructions and step 29 of the older instructions. Oh, interesting. I'm going to read this one out uh, because this is sort of like what the puzzle is all about. Having two sets of instructions is confusing. Burn one. No, wait. The older one must be the younger one after it traveled back in time, so you'd better make them match. There are currently four handwritten corrections in the older one, two of which you need to transfer over to avoid paradoxes. First, seize your shift the S in step four forward by the seventh letter of the answer. Second, cross out step 12 and replace it with increment the time dial by four, then square it, then decrement by one. Although, looking back on it, notice that the second change didn't actually affect the result of step 12 at all. After making these changes, burn one set of instructions, the one that you can burn without causing a paradox. I don't think it makes sense to like stop and try to make sense of this right now. I think uh, I need to keep reading. So here in step 22, um, I think it suggests that we will be sending a time machine through time. It says one of the items you send through time might not fit so well into the time machine, but you should be able to squeeze it in if you pinch the corners down. So I think this is suggesting putting one time machine into another copy of itself. So step 27 says you now have something written in the answer space. It's not the answer, of course. You already know the answer and have some step one. Uh, why are you still working again? Um, anyway, uh, you have a thing written in the answer slot. Maybe you should call it in even though it's wrong. So I think that based on what we saw earlier, that this is saying that in step 27, you have the answer red herring. Yeah, so when HQ calls to tell you that red herring is wrong, it's as a result of this. Take the computer, open a web browser, and navigate to the puzzle page for this puzzle. Type the phrase written in the answer space into the solution box, but don't click submit. Okay, I see, I see. So step 28 and 29, you send a monkey back in time with the computer and have it submit the answer. So that must be red herring uh, being submitted. And we don't know when that is, sometime before time step negative two. So before you start on the puzzle. Okay, makes sense. Xerox these instructions and put the original into the time machine. Step 32, press the big red button to send the instructions back in time. And the only objects in the room are time machine, computer, and instructions. Uh, take the computer and instructions, leave the strange, strange room, and go back to the rest of the hut. Okay. So now I think I have a pretty good sense of what we're getting into. There's not a ton of um, text manipulation. I think that's good. There's not like a lot of steps that... Uh, have you changed other instructions, and have you changed the uh, letters that are in the answer? Yeah, it's definitely not going to be easy, but hopefully manageable. All right, let's look at warm-up A. We need to know the rules for ducks. At the end of each positive prime number time step, after you finish whatever you do, but before anything appears from other times, each duck will act. If it is not in a time machine, it will enter the time machine. If it is in the time machine, it will press the big red button on the time machine it is in. So this one will be easy because we don't change the instructions at all. I, th I think the only thing that travels through time is the duck, so this will be pretty simple. Begin with an empty room except for time machine with dial set to zero. So the dial starts at zero. Uh, get a duck and put it in the room. Add one to the time machine's dial. Okay, now uh, this is a positive prime. If it is not in a time machine, it will enter the time machine. Okay. The duck starts outside the time machine and at the end of step two uh, enters the time machine. So step three, uh, dial is still set to one. The duck is in the time machine. Okay. All right, and then the duck acts at the end of step three since it's another positive prime. So it's in the time machine and it presses the button. The dial is set to one, so it will go from step, from time step three to time step four. The items appear in the center of the room immediately after the time step indicated. All right. So I think this makes sense. Um, when it goes from step three to step four, it appears on step four, by which it means after the instruction is done. So the instruction, there are no ducks in the room, makes sense. Um, so I think that's sort of what this warm-up is helping us learn. Warm-up B is also pretty simple. Um, this one's interesting. It involves a duck, but it doesn't tell you that. But you can deduce it from what you know. So um, the way this works is begin with an empty room except for a time machine with dial set to zero. At the end of step zero, a duck appears in the room. Um, then on step one, subtract one from the time machine's dial. And so the duck is still in the room on, at the end of step one. Uh, step two, subtract two from the time machine's dial. So you so the dial goes to minus three. This is a prime step, so the duck enters the time machine at this point. Um, and then step three, the time machine is not empty. The duck's in there. 
And at the end of step three, since it's a prime step, the duck acts and presses the big red button, which sends it back in time three steps to step zero. Okay. So even though the duck is not mentioned, you can deduce its presence uh, just by the fact that the time machine is not empty in step three. Yeah, there's no other item that will activate the time machine on its own, so we know that it has to be a duck. Uh, you know, there could be other things appearing in from the time machine, like a robot or something, but the fact that we never activate the time machine and something has to get sent through time means the duck has to be involved. Okay, so I think this is pretty... These, these warm-ups are pretty good. They explain how the duck works and exactly what it means to appear on a certain step. I guess one thing I realized from this is that I, when I'm keeping track, I should have two things per step. I should know what it's what the state of the room is after completing the instruction, and then what the state of the room is after uh, things appear from the time machine, uh, ducks and robots act, and everything. So, um, yeah, I might have uh, two lines per step. So at this point, I want to mention that I have looked at this puzzle before. Um, First of all, I actually I saw this in the 2013 MIT Mystery Hunt. I did not try to solve it at all, um, but I thought it looked very interesting. 2013 was my first year doing the Mystery Hunt, and this when I remember when I got to this, it sort of opened my mind as to what Mystery Hunt puzzles could be like. Um, but yeah, it definitely seemed too overwhelming at the time to approach. But yeah, I did look a couple of years later at this again, and I got about this far. It just uh, read the instructions and got through the warm-ups. That was several years ago at this point. I don't remember it that well. From here on, I'm actually solving it for the first time. All right, so before I go through and actually try to figure out what's going on, I thought it would be useful to go through and take a couple of notes. I made a list of all the items that appear at any point. So we've got the instructions, time machine, uh, robot and duck act independently. The computer and the monkey don't have any like uh, pre-programmed actions, but you can you can tell the monkey to use the computer in the past. Cucumber's just not, it doesn't do anything. Um, so this is good. This is a pretty short list of items. And I think the way it's set up, there can't possibly be any other, other items that are on this list. I wrote down all the steps where you are told to put something in one of the answer slots. Uh, so in step two, it says write the appropriate letter in the seventh slot. So there are 10 different such steps and 10 different slots. There's only one step where you're not told which slot you're writing into. And so the only one that's missing from this list is slot two. So it's probably that one. But I think this is pretty solid. Um, like, I don't think there's any way that you could, that the instructions could be changed so that you're not writing uh, something in the first slot on um, step three. I'm not positive I understand this correctly, but I think that uh, in all of this, throughout all of this, you're writing in red herring into the answer slots. Um, and then here in step 31, it says, erase the nonsense thing in the answer space and put the actual final answer instead. So we use the fact that we know that the wrong answer is red herring to figure out what we're writing into here. And that helps us figure out some other things. Um, but then as for how we actually get the answer, uh, that's something different entirely. There are several steps where you are told to use one of the letters in the answer to do something else. So we have several instructions that are like, decrement the time dial by the fourth, fifth, and seventh letters of the answer. So in this case, you are not writing anything into the answer slot, but you are using what was written there through time travel shenanigans um, to affect what you do. And so we have to use these instructions to deduce what was written there. This does not uniquely tell you the fourth, fifth, and seventh letters, even if you knew what uh, there some would be, but there's also this clue here that uh, will help you figure out what the seventh letter of the answer is. So, and um, here's one that lets you know what the fifth letter is. So I think using that, you can get all of the ten different uh, numbers. And the last thing is I wrote down everywhere that the instructions are changed, and it's actually pretty short. There's only two instructions that tell you to modify other instructions for any instruction that can potentially be changed. So 4, 12, 22, and 29. I'm going to mark those. Yeah, so I don't feel like I have a good approach that's going to uh, keep track of everything all the way through. Um, so maybe I'll just try to figure out somewhere to start that I can, that I feel confident about. The only thing that changes the dial by itself is a robot. Um, and that only happens on a time step that ends in five. So here where it says, read the time machine's dial and write into the first slot of the answer. So if we assume that means you're writing an R for red herring, then the dial on this, at the beginning of this, needs to be 
18. Then set the time machine's dial to the number of items in the room. So we don't know what the dial is after that point, but up, up to that point, yeah, up to that point it's 18. So if you don't change a dial and it's not a step that ends in five, then the dial is unchanged. Um, so that means it has to be 18 going back at least a couple steps. There is an issue here that there could be one more, more than one time machine in the room. Um, so when it says, uh, when it sets the time machine's dial, if it turns out there is more than one time machine in the room at this point, I'll have to figure out what that means. Okay, so step four is one that can be modified. So after it's modified, it's just going to say write the time machine's dial into the slot where the final answer has an S. Uh, it's going to be some other letter. Um, so if we're assuming that that is the second slot because that's the only one that we don't write anything into any other time, um, then that's E, the second letter in red herring. Um, which means that the time machine's dial has to be a five at this point. Okay, which means that in step three, when you set the time machine's dial, you're setting it to five. Uh, so that's the number of items in the room. And so it's gonna remain at five until step five when a robot appears. And the robot is going to set to something else. Uh, you put the robot in the time machine and press the big robot, so you send the robot through time. Um, robots always set the dial to a positive value, their age. So it can't be that you send the robot from step six back to step five, the robot that just appeared. All right, so the robot's gonna travel through time at least twice. Figure out what he will set it to and write the result in the 10th slot. So the 10th letter of red herring is G, which is seven. So that tells us when we send the robot through time, it's going to arrive seven steps in the future at the end of step 13. All right, so the, um, the dial will remain at seven until step nine when you change it based on the fourth, fifth, and seventh letters of the answer. All right, so I think that the robot that appears in step 13 will persist until step 18 here when you dispose of it. You know, it doesn't look like there's anything in here that would have the robot move into the time machine. There's in the room a time machine with a dial and that's set to minus four, set to minus four. Um, so whether it was minus four before this or not, the time machine's dial is minus four. So yeah, the robot actually looks like a pretty good place to start. As far as I can tell, it travels through time three times. So first it's in the room from step 20 to step 20. Um, you acquire a robot, put it in the time machine, and press the big red button. And at that point, it goes back in time four steps to step 16, and it continues in the room past step 20. Um, so at that point, there are two robots in the room, um, but only briefly. And then here in step 22, put the robot in the time machine and press the big red button. And at that point, it goes back in time to step four. Yeah, okay, so this should be minus 18 because it goes back from step 22 to step four. And so it sets it to seven, we deduced. Um, so that means the robot's age should be seven at this point. I think that works out. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. So at step 20, its age is zero. At step 17, its age is one. Step 18, its age is two. 19, 20, 21, 22. So step 22, its age is six. And then at step five, its age is seven. Right, so you don't count the step that it gets sent back to. You only count the following step. All right, then step six, you send the robot through time again. As we said, uh, the dial is set to seven at this point. The robot appears in step 13. It's going to set the dial at the end of step 15. Then in step 18, you destroy it. Now this is one of those cases where it says having the robot around is probably confusing. So there, there are two robots in the room at this point. Uh, once from when it was step 16 to 22, and once from when it was step 13 to 18. If there are several copies of the same item present and the instructions do not specify a particular one, they mean the oldest one. So that works out. Um, so when it says destroy the robot, it means the one that is oldest. Yeah, the one that spent more time traveling through time. So I'll know at each step um, how many robots are in the room. Um, and when they act, they only act twice, uh, once at the end of step five, once at the end of step 15. Oh, and I'll, I'll be able to know what they set it to here. So after the robot acts, the dial is set to 10. I'm gonna put the robot ages in this column. So like at step 
16, there's a robot of age 11, and then a robot appears from the uh, sent through time and with an age of 1. So now we've got two robots with ages of 1 and 12 in step 17. Uh, then here in step 18, you destroy the older robot. Um, so we're just left with the younger robot, age 2. Um, and then you con it continues in the room until step 20 when you acquire the robot to begin with, so that's an age of 0. You immediately send that back in time, uh, back to step 17. Um, so now you're just with now you're just left with um, the robot, which now has an age of four, and that remains in the room until step 22. At age of six, it gets sent back in time to step four. Okay, cool. All right, so this column will tell us how many robots are in the room at any time. Okay, the computer and the monkey are close to being uh, solvable. So they both travel through time twice. The computer comes into the room when you start the puzzle and leaves the room when you end the puzzle. The monkey is in a time loop, um, so it travels through time twice, but then gets back to where it started. So the monkey is always holding a computer, um, but you swap out, you, you replace it, so the computer is not uh, stuck in a uh, this stable time loop, but the monkey always has a computer with it. And step 25, I'm able to deduce that the computer's age has to be 50, and we know it goes from step 0 to step 29 before going back in time to before step negative 2. Step negative 2, it goes forward in time to some time before step 25. Um, so if we can figure out one of these, we can figure out the other one. Okay, the cucumber is also quite simple. Uh, you buy a cucumber, put it in the time machine. Um, step 13, you press the big red button. So it's going to get sent back in time. Uh, and we can deduce that it gets sent back in time six steps, because at step 19, when you destroy it, we can deduce that its age should be 14. Um, so to get that to work out, um, at some point it needs to add six to its age. If we knew when it got sent back in time, then we could know where it got sent to. Um, so it seems likely that it's here, step 13. However, if there's a duck in the room on step 11, then the duck will act, and the duck is in the time machine, then the duck will press the big red button on step 11. Um, so that's two possibilities for the cucumber. Either go back in time from step 13 to 7, or step 11 to 5. The travels of the instructions are pretty straightforward. So you bring a set of instructions with you, uh, step zero, and you keep it until the end, uh, step 32, when you send it back in time to step zero again. Uh, step zero, then you have two sets of instructions. Uh, and that stays with you until step 15, when you destroy the one that got sent back in time. I don't think this really matters that much. You don't use the instructions age for anything, as far as I can tell. Okay, so remember I said I wasn't sure if the cucumber got sent back step 11 or step 13. I think we can figure it out based on step 12 here. Step 12 is one of these instructions that gets modified, and it says that when it gets modified, the result winds up being the same. Um, so we know that either of these two uh, instructions should give us the same result. So we know that the camera gets sent back minus 6. So I think it would be possible for the dial to be minus 6 after this instruction. I think the answer is no. Increment the time dial by 4, then square it, then decrement it by 1. So that means you need to square something to get minus 5. So that gave you the case. Uh, so let's say that the dial is set to minus 6 here. Increment the time dial by 4, um, so that becomes negative 2. Square it becomes positive 4. Decrement it by 1 becomes 3. The alternative, add the square of the ninth layer of the final answer to the time dial. Uh, so if the ninth letter is C, then 3 squared is 9. So this also works out. Okay, so I think that's the only way this is going to work out. So there has, there has to be a duck present in the room, um, and the cucumber gets sent back uh, step 11. How does the dial get set to negative 4 in step 20, then? So I think it is possible that something happens after you leave the room, um, but I don't think the robot could come back from that because it has to get into the time machine. I think what probably happens is after you leave, a duck at some point will activate the time machine again. don't think it could take the robot back with it because there's no way to get the robot in the time machine if it appears at step 37. Okay, I, I think I see the issue here. Between when the robot sets the dial 
and step 20, when the robot gets sent back in time, the other time machine needs to appear. So here in step 22, a time machine gets sent back in time. So, so we'll have two time machines in the room at this point, at some point in here. Um, and when it says the time machine, it's referring to the older one. So it's the one that just appeared, uh, having get sent back in time. So that's the one that the robot must take to, uh, must have its dial set to minus four. Uh, that takes the robot back. Uh, so the time machine doesn't really have an age, so in the time machine column, I'm just going to put the dial setting of it. The time there is in the room a time machine with dial not set to minus four, set to minus four. So they should both be minus four at this point. And then you need to put two objects into the time machine, one of which is a time machine, and then you send it back in time four steps. So it appears at the end of 18. At this point, we've got the one back in time, coming back in time, whose dial says minus four. So the only time that the time machine is referred to, when there's two of them, is here in step 20. Uh, and you take the robot and put it in the, put it in the time machine. If there are several copies of the same item and the instructions do not specify a particular one, they mean the oldest one. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take a break to talk about what are called duck conundrum puzzles. I thought that time conundrum, this puzzle was a duck conundrum, but I guess it's not. It's always spelled with a K. So this is a tradition. As you can see it's not every year at the MIT Mystery Hunt of a certain kind of puzzle. So I have done one of these. I've done uh, 2017. I did the cones of Duckshire. Yeah. So this was a fun experience solving it during the mystery hunt in 2017. It was. Um, like midnight, and I didn't know what other puzzle to work on. I'd always heard about the duck conundrum, and everybody says, "Oh, don't, don't uh, try that. It just gets too complicated and frustrating." Um, but, but I wanted to give it a shot, and because I had heard so much about it, and it was fun. It was. It, it took like I think three hours. It wasn't too bad. Um, so I finished around 3 a.m. I just remember it requiring such intense concentration that I like. Uh, I felt very focused. It, it didn't involve this weird time travel stuff. It was just like the rules of a board game and they like relay what you do in the board game. Um, but I remember it would say things like, make the only legal move. So that requires you to like understand all the rules of the game and know what's a legal move and what's not. Um, and of course, if you make one small mistake, then it messes up everything else that follows. So you really have to like concentrate really hard. But I don't know why time conundrum is not considered. They they didn't consider it one. It's in this uh, broader category that they call following directions. So after recording this, I realized what it is is that all official duck conundrum puzzles are by a single author named Dan Katz, which this puzzle is not. I'll talk more about this at the end of the video. As you can see, just because something writes out the instructions and you follow it, does not make it an easy puzzle. So if this wasn't a duck conundrum puzzle, why did they include a duck? I don't know. Where was I? So step 11, the time dial needs to be minus six. Count the number of C's present and the names of all items present. Write the sum of that and the time dial in the eighth slot. I is the eighth letter of red herring, so that's a nine. So we need 15 C's to be present. Time machine has one. Instructions has one, and we've got two sets of instructions. Cucumber has two, and computer has one. So that's six. So we need nine other C's, like nine ducks in the room or something. So I'm sure that there are, there's at least one duck causing problems here, but they're mentioned very little. Step 22 says kill all ducks in the room. Uh, the fact that we never bring any ducks into the room, I think means that there must be no ducks in the room, because otherwise something would be destroyed without it ever being added. Step 26 is remove the duck from the time machine, and that's it. We don't see anything else that we do with the ducks, but of course they act They act by themselves. I'm sorry, enter the time machine on step 23, and it was not present in the room in step 22, so it has to arrive, I think, on step 22. So the duck acts before anything appears from other times. So if it arrived on step 23, it would not enter the time machine on step 23. So it has to, enter, has to arrive on step 22. So the duck acts after you finish whatever you do. So the duck will not enter, so the duck will not be in the time machine when you press the big red button here. Oh, okay, interesting, okay. So I, so I did make a mistake. So the duck 
so when you put the instructions in on step 31 and press the big red button on step 32, the duck acts in between there. So the duck actually sends the instructions back before you press the big red button. And that happens on step 31. So the time dial must be set to minus 31. All right, so the duck that arrives in step zero will act on step two to enter the time machine. And then we'll act on step three to activate the time machine. We know that the time machine dial is set to five at this point, so it will go to step eight. All right, we'll remain outside the time machine until step 11. But I also need a duck to press the big red button on this turn to send the cucumber back. So does that mean there are at least two ducks here? If there are multiple items taking actions, the one that press the big red buttons act before any others. Um, and multiple items pressing the big red button act simultaneously. Okay, yeah, so we could have two ducks. One of them is already in the time machine at this point, presses the button, takes the cucumber back, and then the duck that's out goes in till step 13, when it gets sent to step 16. All right, so the duck goes into the time machine on step 17. On step 18, another time machine appears. Its dial is set to negative four, but the duck's not in that one. Um, then on step 19, the duck acts, pressing the big red button on the time machine that it's in. So it will go forward 17 steps. All right, so we're not going to have any more instructions, but the duck appears, then on step 37, duck acts, and on step 41, it will push the big red button. So, so in step 32, we leave the time machine with a certain number on it, um, so we have to figure out what, where this duck winds up, so we know what that setting was. Um, but we know that we have a duck arriving on step 22, so it could be that one as well. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start trying to extract some of the letters in the answer and see if these, I haven't looked at these at all, um, see if any of these leads to another contradiction so there could be a place where I have a mistake. Yeah, we're pretty close to being able to get a few letters out of the answer. Um, but some of them are related to each other, like we can tell uh, that the seventh letter is 19 characters later in the alphabet than the second letter. So we know that the time machine starts off with its dial at 18. Uh, right, because in step three, we read the time machine's dial and write it into the first slot of the answer. Okay, so that means when the monkey uh, goes back to before step negative two, um, and then enters the time machine on step negative two and presses the button, it will go ahead 18 steps to step 16. All right, so we know that in step 25, this computer has to have an age of 50, uh, the computer that arrives in step 16. So we can uh, go back to determine how old it was when it arrived. So in step 17, the computer's age must be 42. So in step negative 2, its age must have been 41. So now in step 29, when the computer gets sent back in time, it has an age of 29. So the first step after it arrives, it will have an age of 30. So if its age is 41 at step negative 2, um, its age would be 30 at step negative 13. Uh, which means it arrives in step negative 14. Okay, great, so when we decrement the time machine's dial by the eighth letter of the answer, we're decrementing it by 25. When we increment it by three less than the fifth letter of the final answer, we're incrementing it by 12, which means the fifth letter is 15. Oh wait, actually this is a problem. Okay, so so I'm gonna have to redo some of this, but so there's two computers in the room at this point. So we need to put the, the younger one, which is not being held by the monkey, into the time machine. We're putting the younger time machine and the youngest computer into the time machine and sending them back four steps to step 18. So in fact, there are three computers um, present at this time. Uh, one's the one you brought in, one's the one you just sent back to yourself, and the third one is being held by the monkey. However, okay, so here, uh, we get back to where we just sent the computer from. So this computer that's age 22 gets sent back in time, so we're only left with the one that's 26. So all of the computer ages up to the point where it 
gets sent back with the monkey are low by four. So that means when you send the monkey and the computer back in time, the computer's age, at the next step will be 34, not 30. This will be minus nine, and this will be minus 10. Yeah, monkey and computer go to step negative 10, which means this has to say negative 39. Okay, so that changes a couple of our letters. Um, when you decrement the time machine's dial by the eighth letter of the answer, it's now uh, 21. And when you increment by three less than the fifth letter of the answer, you're incrementing by eight, which makes the fifth letter of the answer 11. Okay, cool. So the duck gets sent back with the instructions to step zero. On um, step two, it enters the time machine, and on step three, it presses the button, sending it five steps ahead to step eight. So the duck that appears in step eight enters the time machine on step 11 and presses the button on step 13. No, it doesn't press the button. Uh, it's in there when you press the button. So that sends it three steps ahead to step 16. The duck arrives from step 13 to step 16, along with a couple other things. Um, it enters the time machine on step 17 uh, step 18, another time machine appears, but that doesn't matter. And then in step 19, it pushes the red button on its time machine going forward to 36. It enters the time machine on step 37, and step 41 goes back in time, likely to 22. Let's just say that and see what happens. So if that's the case, it's going to be minus 19. Then on step 23, it enters the time machine. On step 26, you remove it from the time machine. On step 29, it goes back in the time machine just after you send the monkey back. And then step 31, just after you put the instructions in, the duck pushes the button, just before you push the button. So assuming that's that's right, um, joining up these correctly, uh, this duck is caught in a time loop. I, mean, I think we can just add up the durations of each step here. So 0 to 5 is 5 time steps, 8 to 13 is 5, 16 to 19 is 3, plus 5, plus 9, 27. So that is the duration of the duck's time loop, which matters for step 24 here. The object present with the shortest name has never been created nor destroyed. Figure out the period of the time loop and note that this length is equal to the sum of the second and third letters of the answer. So that makes sense, but I don't think that's every duck because uh, we still need something to send the cucumber back in step 11. There is a duck present, but it on that turn, on step 11, it enters the time machine. So I think we should have a second duck here that is already in the time machine, step 11. If we go back in time step, six steps to step five, enters the time machine on step seven, press the button on step 11, goes back six steps to step five. Yeah, I wonder if there's any other ducks that could be consistent like that that could just be added somewhere in here that wouldn't affect anything else. So you could figure it, I could, I could try just like saying, okay, what if a duck appears here? Um, what would happen to it? There's also the fact that this could actually be any number of ducks. If you had 10 ducks in this loop, that wouldn't change anything. They would all enter the time machine on step seven. Uh, if any one of them pushed the button, they would all go back in time. Yeah, right, okay, step 10, count the number of C's present in the names of all the items. And based on what I knew, I thought that would have to be 15, which would mean we need nine ducks. Uh, time machine is one, computer is one, instructions is one each, cucumber is two, one plus one plus two plus two is six. Then we need nine ducks. So what happens if we have eight ducks in this shorter time loop in addition to the one that we've seen go through everywhere else. So that affects step eight, where it says count the number of vowels present in the names of all of the items. So if we had eight ducks, that would be, each duck has one vowel, so 27. So that means the sixth letter of the answer is 19. So we had eight extra ducks there. Step four says, read the time machine's dial and write it in the slot where the final answer has an S. And we, we think this is the second slot. So you'd think that means that the answer, the second letter of the answer is S. However, step 15 says you Caesar shift the S in step four forward by the seventh letter of the answer. And we, we said that was 
1. So that means the second letter should be T. You follow the instructions as they are written when you get to them. If instruction 5 says to cross off instruction 4, then you'll still do instruction 4 when time step 4 comes along. So I don't really understand that, but I think you do change it because you send the instructions back in time. I think that this is just saying if you had already done instruction 4, then crossing off wouldn't like retroactively change anything. I, I'm a little worried that I'm misunderstanding what they're saying here, but um, let's just go with it. We said that the length of the duck's time loop, which was 27, is the sum of the second and third letters, so third letter is 7. Yeah, so the third letter of the answer is involved in this confusing part here, which I have been avoiding reading closely. Append the following instructions to the end of step 22 of the younger instructions and to step 29 of the older instructions. However, uh, it doesn't matter because from this point on they're the same, because in step 15 you make them match. So you write this same thing in step 22 of the younger instructions and step 29 of the older instructions. And since the younger instructions become the older instructions, I assume that means that they're going to remain there. When you got the in older instructions back in step 0, it must have already had this change made in step 22. So I think this is just means we do this uh, twice when we get to step 22 and step 29. Write the sum of the digits in the time dial, ignoring the negative sign, minus the third letter of the answer in the third slot. So what is the time dial on step 22? Uh, minus 18, so that's a sum of 9. What is on step 29? Minus 39, so that's a 12. So the sum of the digits in the time dial is either 9 or 12. And the third slot, R-E-D, red herring, uh, should be a 4. So the third letter of the answer should either be a 5 or an 8. I want the third letter to be a 7. Okay. Okay. Okay, no, 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 I think, I think I understand. I think this is just sort of a trick to make sure you're paying attention. So you write on step 22 of the younger instructions and step 29 of the older instructions, but you're never going to follow that step 29 of the older instructions. Um, when it says you better make them match, it doesn't mean you make them match exactly. It says there are currently four handwritten corrections on the older one, two of which you need to transfer to avoid paradoxes. And then it describes, and here it describes what those two are. So it doesn't say that you copy over instructions on step 29 to the younger version. Only the change on step 22 is going to appear on the younger instructions. So you're not going to follow the instruction on step 29 because that was only on a copy of instructions got burned. Third letter of the answer has to be five. Well, that's too bad. So, so now I've got at least one guess for each letter of the answer. Um, I could at least uh, try it out, see if it spells something. At least let me know uh, where I'm making a mistake. Okay, Stagak sauce. All right, so it looks like this could be the answer. Uh, the only problem is that this three should be a five, not a seven, so it spells steak sauce. Okay, so I must have the duck's path wrong somehow. Arrives at step zero, enters the time machine at step two, and disappears at step three. Wait. Okay, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I put zero to five. Yeah, it, go it goes ahead by five from three to eight. Okay. All right, 25. All right. Let's try it out. Into your guess. Okay, great. Solved. The answer was steak sauce. All right. Now that we've solved the time conundrum, I thought it might be fun to recount the complete timeline. The distant past. A time machine stands alone in the room. Its dial is set to 18. Step negative 10. A monkey holding a computer appears in the center of the room, having been sent from the future from step 29. The computer has an age of 33 and is set to submit the answer red herring for the puzzle. Step negative 9. Following its instructions, the monkey hits submit on the computer. HQ calls to tell you that red herring is incorrect and the puzzle unlocks. Step negative 2. The monkey enters the time machine with computer. The monkey presses the big red button, sending itself and the computer forward in time to step 16. Step 0. You enter the room. You bring a computer with an age of 0 and an unmodified set of instructions with no answer blanks filled in. A duck and a set of instructions arrive from step 31. The instructions have the answer steak sauce filled in and modifications to steps 4, 12, and 22. Step 1. You submit the answer steak sauce and complete the puzzle. Step 2. You begin following the older instructions from the future. You begin filling in the answer red herring on the younger instructions to avoid a paradox placing an R in the seventh blank. The duck acts entering the time machine. Step 3. You use the time dial to place an R in the first blank. You set the time dial 
dial to 5, the number of objects in the room. The duck acts, pressing the big red button, sending itself forward to step 8. Step 4. Following the modified step 4 of the older instructions, you use the time dial to place an E in the second blank where the answer has a T. A robot with an age of 6 arrives from step 22. Step 5. You use the robot's age to place a G in the tenth blank. The robot acts, changing the time dial to 7. 8 ducks and a cucumber with an age of 0 arrive from the future from step 11. We don't know whether this is 8 different ducks or 1 duck 8 times or something in between. Any of these is possible. Step 6. You put the robot in the time machine. You press the big red button, sending the robot ahead to step 13. Step 7. The ducks act, entering the time machine. Step 8. You use the number of vowels in the names of all items present to place an H in the fourth blank. The duck arrives from step 3. Step 9. You use the answer to change the time dial to negative 6. Step 10. You use the number of C's in the names of all items present in the time dial to place an I in the eighth blank. Step 11. You buy a cucumber with an age of 0 and place it in the time machine. All eight ducks in the time machine act simultaneously pressing the big red button, sending themselves in the cucumber back to step 5. The remaining duck acts entering the time machine. Step 12. You follow the modified step 12 changing the time dial to 3. However, if you'd follow the original step 12, you still would have changed the time dial to 3. Step 13. You press the big red button, sending the duck to step 16. The robot arrives from step 6. Step 14. You make a change to step 22 of the younger instructions and step 29 of the older instructions. Step 15. You copy over the two changes to steps 4 and 12 from the older instructions to the younger instructions. You burn the older instructions to make things less confusing. The robot acts, setting the time dial to 10. Step 16. You write the length of the shortest item name present, 5 for the robot, to the fifth blank. The duck arrives from step 13. The robot arrives from step 20 with an age of 0. The monkey arrives from step negative 2, holding a computer. Step 17. You change the time dial to 17. The duck acts, entering the time machine. Step 18. You dispose of the older robot. Two items arrive from step 22. A time machine with its corners pinched down and its time dial set to negative 4, and a computer. Step 19. You use the cucumber's age to place an N in the ninth blank and eat the cucumber. The duck acts, pressing the big red button on the time machine it's in, sending itself forward to step 36. Step 20. You buy a robot with an age of 0 and place it into the older time machine. You press the big red button, sending the robot back to step 16. Step 21. You set the younger time machine's dial to negative 4. Step 22. You pinch down the corners of the younger time machine and squeeze it into the older time machine along with the youngest computer. You press the big red button, sending them back to step 18. You use the answer to change the time dial to negative 18. You place the robot in the time machine and press the big red button, sending the robot back to step 4. Following the modified step 22, you use the time dial and answer to place a D in the third blank. The duck arrives from the future again, this time from step 41. Step 23, you use the answer to change the time dial to negative 39. The duck acts, entering the time machine. Step 24, you determine the length of the duck's perpetual time loop, which is 25 steps. Step 25, you use the age of the older computer, the one being held by the monkey, to place an R in the sixth blank. Step 26, you remove the duck from the time machine. Step 27, the answer blanks are filled with red herring, which you know is wrong. Step 28, you get the younger computer ready to submit red herring. Since the puzzle is already solved at this point, I think you need to edit the HTML or something to access the solution box but at any rate, you don't click submit. You take the older computer from the monkey and give him your computer. You place the monkey in the time machine. Step 29. You instruct the monkey to click submit on the computer once he gets to the past. Then use the time machine at step negative 2. You press the big red button, sending the monkey back to step negative 10. The duck acts entering the time machine. Step 30. You use the answer to change the time dial to negative 31. Step 31. You erase the incorrect answer red herring from your instructions or replace it with the correct answer steak sauce. You photocopy the instructions and place the original in the time machine. The duck acts, pressing the big red button, sending itself and the original instructions back to step 0. Step 32, you press the big red button, nothing happens. Using the answer, you set the time dial to negative 19. You take your computer and instructions and leave this strange, strange room and go back to the rest of the hunt. Nothing happens until step 36 when the duck arrives from step 19. Step 37, the duck acts entering the time machine. Step 41, the duck acts, pressing the big red button, sending itself back to step 22. That's everything we know about and that might be it. However, it's also possible that more ducks appear at certain times in the future. For example, in step 34 quadrillion, you could have 137 ducks arrive. They would hang out until the next prime numbered step, in this case 34 quadrillion 9, at which point they would act, entering the time machine. They would hang out again until the next prime numbered step, in this case 34 quadrillion 19, at which point they would act, pressing the big red button, sending themselves back 19 steps to step 34 quadrillion. With a dial set to negative 19, this could happen on any step that's a prime number such that there's exactly one prime in the 18 numbers before it. It's as if a time machine sitting in a room with its dial set to a negative number can cause ducks to spontaneously exist and then not exist at certain times without ever being created or destroyed, which is kind of weird, but I guess we're throwing causality out the window with this puzzle in the first place. As of 2023, it's an open question in mathematics whether the limit and femum of the prime gap is 18 or less, which is equivalent to there being infinitely many numbers where ducks can appear. However, there were some advances made in 2014 on this front, so maybe someday soon somebody will be able to prove whether there are necessarily a finite number of ducks in this puzzle. Okay, that was Time Conundrum by David Farhi. I do want to start by clearing up this question of what is a duck conundrum. I was not aware of this when I started this video, but the original duck conundrum from 2000 was written by a puzzle player named Dan Katz, and all the ones classified on this page as duck conundrum are by Dan Katz. I guess he's the only one authorized to uh, write official ones. Anything else is a uh, similar non-duck conundrum puzzle. Yeah, so this list of uh, similar puzzles includes Time Conundrum and a bunch of others. I mean, I looked at a few of these. 
I don't think these are all like as directive references to Duck Conundrum as Time Conundrum is. Some of them are pretty different, but you do see ducks mentioned a couple times here. I found uh, a live journal post from Dan Katz from 2009, where he talks about duck conundrums. And he does say, hands off the duck, that's my calling card. So I guess that's probably a pretty reasonable request. He's talking about questions of puzzle setting etiquette, which I don't think is there's a consensus on. I'm sure if any of these, including time conundrum, involves a duck, it's uh, a unintentional infringement. You know, I wouldn't think to go look at an author's live journal if I was going to make an homage to something they'd done. So, about the puzzle itself, there's a solution online. It's pretty dry. It's a PDF, and it looks to be formatted like an academic preprint. I think it was probably written in LaTeX. And it's just a, a proof that the of how you would solve the puzzle. Um, there's no like information about the puzzle other than that. I looked online to see if the author had written anything else about this puzzle. I couldn't find anything. Um, I did see a couple people say that they enjoyed it, um, which is cool. And this puzzle is one of only a couple puzzles uh, to get a call out uh, in the wrap-up ceremony video for the 2013 Mystery Hunt. They say in there they got a lot of requests to talk about it because a lot of people liked it. It sounds like people really enjoyed the idea of having a wrong answer submitted before you even have the puzzle unlocked. And they said it was logistically difficult to have them respond to a wrong answer before the puzzle was unlocked for each team. So I, I thought that was cool that uh, even for a fairly straightforward logic puzzle like this, you can still find ways to you know, do things that have never been seen at Mystery Hunt before. So yeah, I enjoyed the solving process. I thought the logic was pretty good uh, difficulty level. Um, I like that they had a few different mechanics that came together in different ways. Yeah, there were a few things that uh, could have potentially been complicated, but they didn't really use it to the fullest extent, um, like sending a time machine through time and modifying the directions and uh, giving the monkey instructions to perform at a different time. Oh yeah, and having the instructions go through time so you had different versions of the instructions to work on. None of those were too bad. It was just like one step that you had to do for each one of those. Um, and potentially if you had had like the time machine going through multiple times, it could have gotten really complicated. And I think they avoided that. So yeah, it was interesting. It, it was a bunch of uh, simple pieces that uh, came together to make it complex rather than a single mechanic that just got as complex as it could be. Yeah, these warm-ups were a great idea. They definitely helped explain a couple of things that were not completely intuitive reading the directions. Yeah, another one that would have helped me a little bit is understanding the ages of objects, so maybe if they'd had one of these wormers with a robot, that would have been helpful too. But yeah, you know, but it was it wasn't too bad. I thought this was good. This showed that you could have a duck in a closed time like curve, um, so with no beginning or end, uh, just looping back on itself. I don't know if I want to think too hard about the eight ducks that only exist for six time steps, just getting caught in a loop like that. It's like they always say, if winking in and out of existence spontaneously sounds like existential horror to you, you probably shouldn't go stepping into time machines and pushing big red buttons on them. I mean, I guess the ducks are bringing it on themselves, but we're the ones who send the monkey back. Um, so yeah, so I guess I feel bad for the monkey. I thought this was a great puzzle. I'm glad I finally got around to solving it. I really enjoyed it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.